This is Bit Silly, WPI's first true walking plastic ant weight class combat robot. Hi, I'm Alex, and I'll be going over versions 1 through 2.5 of its design. For a bit of background for those still learning about combat robotics, or to set up the design constraints for the robot's original design, combat robotics is split by weight classes and WPI offers bonuses for non-standard mechanical movement systems and control systems. The competition this robot was originally meant for is a plastic one-pound division that Team WPI hosts for its students three to four times a year. The bonus WPI offers is 1.5 times the weight class for true walkers. Most other competitions will offer double or don't do weight bonuses at all. Plastic means materials are generally limited to 3D printed materials like PLA and PETG. Though parts like bearings or screws are allowed within the spirit of the rules. Matches are three minutes long. The goal is to either get the opponent robot to stop translating across the arena or to win through a judge's decision, which is too much to get into here, but most competitions have published judging rubrics if you're curious. These are also blanket statements or just what WPI uses. Each competition or even school that hosts usually has variations in rules. Starting with version one, the main constraints slash goals I needed to aim for were a design that was invertible, so I didn't need to self-write during a match, and I couldn't get stuck. I also wanted to fit most parts on an A1 mini print bed, since that's a printer that's pretty accessible on campus, and it's the printer that I own myself. Another requirement that I had to hit was to follow WPI's plant rule set, which means I have to either use kit electronics slash equivalents, or spend less than $50 total. Servos don't count, but this helped make most of my electronics decisions for me. Okay, to start off the design overview, I'm gonna talk about the legs. The legs are mounted in the center of the chassis. They take up about 50% of the internals within the ring. The way that they are originally mounted is directly to the chassis using the first servo. I use a clamp system in each link just because I think it reduces the amount of force that is applied to the servo. Uh, I would rather have force applied to the chassis that can take multiple hits than to a servo that over time is much more expensive than a 3D printed part and will damage just much more easily, especially in matches where there's a lot of consecutive hits. The way that they're actually screwed together is you have one screw that screws through the top of the clamp into the servo horn and then into the servo itself. Then you have this piece on the bottom that screws into the first 3D printed piece, essentially the link one part that holds the servo. It screws directly into that, just using plastites. I, it's also a convenient way for me to slip a wire through and have it in the middle without any massive wire channels. The way that the second half of the leg is attached following the same pattern Plastic part screwed into the servo horn, screwed into the servo, and then a clamp on the other side. This is also pretty helpful because it means it is super easy for me to replace leg pads without taking off a bunch of parts and extra, and extra screws that I don't really need. It is definitely a pain to maintenance when it is in the actual robot because the ring and the chassis are such huge parts that it's more effective sometimes to swap the entire leg or take the entire leg off and then swap the specific servo that I need than to do maintenance on individual parts. Essentially, it moves like this. You move the first link around, move the second link down, and then repeat that loop over and over again. And that is the walking cycle of the robot. The legs stick out pretty far. One of the biggest concerns is how to avoid getting them hit. The strategy I came up with is to have them partially fold into the shell, since in the plant weight division, you don't have as many robots that are true overheads. They can stick out one side or the other, and it's not as much of an issue. Hits don't happen as fast, it's not as uncontrolled, and plastic, especially when printed correctly and using higher quality versions like PLA Pro and Super PLA, tend to be pretty durable. The way that the weapon works is through a friction drive. So I have repeat 2822 
plant loader. Then I put a plastic mount on top of that. And on top of that, I don't have it modeled, but there are little curves for two O-rings to fit. Those press against the ring. And as the motor spins up, the weapon actually spins up as well. The big advantage of this means when I get hit really hard, there's no damage on the motor. And I was terrified with such a big weapon that I would get a really big hit and then I would break the motor since that's a really big issue for other plants at WPI. The way that the weapon is held in place, I have six bearings constraining it vertically. And then I have four bearings constraining it radially. You can see them here here and here. I don't have them fully in the CAD, but the idea was that I would cut these little stainless steel shafts, slide a bearing on, and then that would be double supported both on the top and the bottom. You can see the bottom mount here that holds those bearings in place. Slides the shaft in, and then the bearing is attached through tight fit on the shaft. The actual weapon was my very first time making any sort of ring spinner weapon. I made this itty bitty ring that got almost no bite because the counterweight was so big. It had this massive tooth on it that wasn't very effective. I don't think I ever formally ran it in a match, but the version that I did run was this really wacky sloped ring. While it wasn't great at causing damage, it was really, really good at stopping damage from other robots. It was a great defensive choice. I ran a match against another robot and neither of us could get an effective hit on each other. Not the best for combat robotics watching, but really good for saving your electronics, especially when I was terrified of taking a big hit and damaging the leg system. The chassis of this robot isn't anything too, too special, more just funky shape in order to fit the legs in and provide as much strength as possible. It has a little lip at the bottom here to put the bearings in and provided some pretty good structural support. I definitely had a few odd features. I have no idea why I decided to shape it like this other than possibly saving weight. Uh, there was a lot of funky things. This was my second combat robot that I'd ever made. That's part of why some of my decisions were pretty odd. I have some pretty funky fillet and chamfer combinations down on the bottom here as well. Again, not my best work, but I was still learning. The way that the chassis was actually assembled is these gray parts are all plastic and had screws screwed into them. Bit funky, I thought it would be easier to replace items when they were damaged, but in the long run it really was just annoying to assemble the robot and put it together. I had a these thin inner walls, just so my electronics weren't exposed. WPI has a no visible battery policy. And if a battery was able to be seen through one of these walls, that would not have passed safety. I do have little tiny wire channels. Those are perfectly within the rules. That is so that way the servos have wires that can come inside. The other servos, the ones that were mounted first, just had wire channels internally. So those wires never had to be exposed. Most of the features that I had on the bottom of the chassis were just mirrored to the top part with an addition of a switch hole, but the bearing channels were the same features and same geometry. It really wasn't anything too, too special, aside from some funky area for the legs and some tiny structural support so that my wires weren't exposed, since again, that's generally discouraged at our competitions. Some of the big issues with the design were that the servos would begin to shake back and forth or generally get weaker towards the end of a match. The shaking, I think, is from the encoders getting damaged from impacts and general overuse. The SG90s also have plastic gears, which strip faster compared to metal geared servos. Another issue were connectors between the top and bottom fractured immediately when hit hard enough. It made an already tricky to put together robot worse. I would not recommend doing this. Ring bearings in the same chassis weren't held in by anything when assembling, so I had to awkwardly press the weapon into the top of the chassis and then place it gently on the bottom chassis. 
There was also an issue with the ring design and its printing. It split along layer lines during one of the hits, and because it is such a big piece, it shouldn't be splitting at all. This is due to just poor print settings. Another issue was the ring was a quarter pound under where I thought it would be. It is a solid piece. The predictions should be pretty accurate when it is solid plastic. And that meant I was missing out on a weight bonus that I should have taken full advantage of. It also had almost no bite and it just didn't damage the opponent in either version, which was really frustrating. So naturally, I need to improve the tooth design and make it bigger and able to actually bite other robots, especially since it moves so slow because it's a walker. And then the final issue was my wire management. I won't even explain this one. Just photo of shame. Starting on version two, some of the main constraints slash goals that I had were to follow Northeastern University's plant rule set. They give 200% or two pounds for shoe walkers, which is the most common weight bonus used. My goal was also to bring its weight up to 1.75 pounds and be able to accurately predict its weight because of the issues that I had with the ring being so far off in its predictions. I also wanted to make a chassis that could still be used within the WPI competition, so most of the weight difference would be within the ring itself. The first fix that I made from the previous version was I upgraded from SG90s to MG90s since metal gears are better than plastic gears for durability, and that means less stripping of the gears themselves. I also personally think that the MG90s are just assembled a little bit more robust than their SG90 counterparts. The feature that I added was I put those chassis connector feature into the bottom of the chassis itself, so it was just one solid part, didn't have any of the braking issues like it had had before, and it was just much cleaner and it was way more consistent to put together. I also was able to fill it all the bottom of the chassis, which, while it wasn't that important, does slightly improve the structural integrity of the print. Another thing that I did was I printed a way bigger ring. This is, frankly, a massive ring. This is something that could be seen on a beetle. It is 10 and a half inches from tip to tip, which is the effective diameter, which is bonkers for a plant to get up to size. I also was able to play around with the tooth geometry, and this is just a massive tooth with all of its support material actually supporting what's hitting and not used as ineffectively as in the previous version. Another thing is, while it's not that important, I got rid of a lot of small, weird features. There's a fillet here and there to improve the structural integrity. There's no weird little lips or ridges like there were in the previous version. And I think it just makes it look a lot cleaner and a lot more professional. To review some of the big issues that this version of the robot had, the weapon would frequently die. This is partially due to a really inconsistent ESE and having the wrong startup torque for the much heavier ring than what I had previously. Big thank you to Jaren for the last minute help. I also practically encased the motor in plastic and it overheated so badly I needed to use a heat gun to remove the O-ring mount, which didn't help matters either. The ESC was inconsistent throughout the day and was fixed when we swapped. I'm not too sure why the ESC in the first place was inconsistent, but I did take my electronics back home and I'm hoping that the high humidity of my hometown plus the age of the electronics just killed the ESC. Another issue that I first noticed during this event was that I would end up on the side of the robot with little to no pushing from the other robot. This is because my weapon has a higher moment of inertia than the rest of my chassis does. When the robot first spins up, if the ring has a higher MOI, then the chassis spins until the acceleration is over and it has the chance to stabilize and start spinning the weapon, not the chassis. This is also part of the reason it takes the robot a while to stop spinning itself in place on top of the traction issues that come with legs and moving my center of mass when I move the robot. Finally, for version 2.5, some of my main constraints slash goals were to readjust back to the WPI rule set and reduce the robot's weight to 1.5 pounds, as well as reduce how often the robot got stuck on its side and make sure it could get unstuck. For my changes, the first big change that I made was to the weapon geometry. Uh, one of the biggest, most obvious features is the increase in chamfers. This is hopefully to make it so that way when the robot inevitably does pop up on its side, it's still able to roll back down to the top or the bottom and not just get stuck there. 
Additionally, I played around a little bit with tooth geometry. It's nowhere as big as the version that I ran at Northeastern, coming in only at 10.3 inches instead of, I want to say, about 10 and a half. But the tooth geometry is still much better than the original version. Another detail that is different is the height of the actual weapon is shorter than it was before. This, combined with a slightly smaller tooth geometry, should make a lighter weapon and help me decrease the MOI that I had and hopefully reduce the amount of times that I pop up on my side in the first place. Another change that I made was I swapped to Super PLA Plus from Overture. It's considered slightly better at deforming without shattering than standard PLA or standard PLA Pro. It's also slightly lighter than PLA Pro, which is what I ran in every version prior. I didn't find it made much of a difference, especially because I make such large heavy parts. So I'll probably go back to Pro because there's a significant price difference and I don't want to spend extra money. And the final change that I made was to adjust the O-ring mount that I used. I wanted to add in slots to help ventilate the motor a bit more so it was less encased, especially because of how I mount the O-rings does require the motor mount to go over the sides of the motor and block a lot of heat from escaping. I felt that adding vents up top, especially because the motor does come with holes on the top of it naturally because of its design, I felt this would be a really effective way to help ventilate the motor and reduce the amount of heat that was getting concentrated just on the motor and the motor mount and causing the overheating issues for the motor specifically. Some of the big issues with this version of the robot is that the weapon would frequently die. This is due to a mechanical issue over the ESC issue that I had last version. The bearing shafts that constrain the ring radially would bend inward on a large enough hit, and I was not getting enough friction to spin the weapon up to speed or at all in some cases. I also successfully moved my overheating issue from the motor slash o-ring mount to overheating my o-rings and my ring itself. This left little melted indents in the ring. This also meant my o-rings now overheated and melted into the ring, into the inner walls, and in one case, even through the inner walls, meaning I potentially had hot rubber landing and getting on my electronics, which is not ideal. The other issue that I had was the robot ended on its side again. This is likely due to the weight of the ring being too heavy relative to the distance it is from the axis of rotation, since inertia is calculated by finding the mass at a distance from the axis of rotation itself. It just means that the ring because it is so much bigger and further out than the chassis, despite being less than the weight of the chassis, means it wants to spin less than the chassis wants to spin. The bright side is the robot fell on its side quickly after I turned the weapon motor down each time that it did get popped up on its side, so at least it's not getting stuck and not having the same mobility issues that I was afraid of originally. For version 3, I'm planning to swap to a geared system for the weapon, as well as redesign the legs to give them more surface area with the ground. I've already created a GitHub repo and worked on some of the basic control loop as well as the logic for individual movement functions, but I'd love to make a semi-autonomous version in the future. As of right now, it's a little bit of a project in the back burner. I've really enjoyed working on this robot to the point I'm working on a true walking beetle mate robot, which is a concept that's upscaled from my plan. If all goes well, I'll compete with my beetle at November NHRL. For the plant, versions 1 through 2.5 are published on Onshape, which you can find links to each through my personal website on my profile, as well as other information on my website. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed what is a very lengthy design overview video. If you want to see more content like this and watch as I grow and develop my combat robotics skills, feel free to stick around or check out my website to see other things that I'm working on.